We are very, very honored to have with us today Dr. Sarit Katan Gribitz, who is an Associate Professor of Classical Judaism in the Theology de Department at Fordham University. Her first book, Time and Difference in Rabbinic Judaism, which is the book she, she will be talking about today, um, was published by Princeton University Press and received the 2020 National Jewish Book Award in scholarship. Um, so thank you everyone for joining. There will be time for Q&A at the end. Um, you'll have a chance to ask your questions, but if something comes up during the presentation um, and you would like to write it in the chat, we will save it for the end and get to it at Q&A time. Um, and I think that is all. I will turn it over to you now. Sari, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Um, good afternoon to those of you on the West Coast. Good morning to those, uh, sorry, good afternoon to those on the East Coast. And good morning to those on the West Coast. Um, and good evening if anyone is uh, Zooming from across the Atlantic. Um, I want to begin by thanking Julie Seltzer and Sharon Weiss Greenberg for the kind invitation to speak about my book, Time and Difference in Rabbinic Judaism, and also for organizing today's event. And I want to thank all of you for joining me today. And as Julie mentioned, um, feel free to add questions or comments into the chat and we will get there, um, if not during the talk, then afterwards. Um, in the next 45 minutes or so, I hope to share some of the big ideas from my book with you um, and to read some of my favorite ancient rabbinic sources about time together and to think through what we can learn from them. But before going back in time to the first centuries CE, I want to take you to my classroom at Fordham University in New York. The semester I taught an undergraduate course about time and value. During one particularly illuminating discussion with my students, I asked each of them to articulate what it meant for them to be punctual. And their, answer, their, their answers varied and surprised me. There were just as many answers as students in the room. As we listened to one another, we learned that for some students, being punctual meant being early, while for others, showing up before the end of an event constituted punctuality. I shared with my students the idea of Jewish time, which simply means late. Um, and they introduced me to Dominican time, CPT, and gay standard time. We realized together not only that conceptions and practices of time are culturally specific, relative, and local, but also that time can be deliberately used individually and communally to assert and celebrate ethnic, racial, religious, and gendered difference. The legislation and use of time, we learned, can oppress others, and it can likewise be harnessed as a form of resistance. I describe this scene in the prologue of my book. The example of punctuality is poignant because it illustrates so clearly the underlying contention of my book, which is that time is culturally constructed, historically contingent, and disciplinarily specific. The very basic assumptions we make about time, what time of day it is, what month it is, where we are in the span of history, are neither natural nor universal, but rather the products of the societies and the communities in which we live, even when they seem natural or biological because they're bound up with natural processes, such as the rising and the setting of the sun, the phases of the moon, the changing of the seasons, or the aging of our bodies. Units of time, such as years, months, weeks, days, and hours, as well as our experiences of those units and of time's passage more generally, are constructed. And the ways in which we divide time and use time is not arbitrary. Quite the opposite, it reveals our deepest societal and individual values because how we choose to spend our time and organize our time is a reflection of what we value. This past year um, and a half of the pandemic uh, really taught us that lesson um, in, in an important way. 
in March 2020, as soon as cities shut down, routines were uprooted, and we began counting in cycles of daily virus counts, weekly testing averages, and two-week quarantines, we all became urgently aware of the constructedness of time. Um, here is the first pandemic issue of The New Yorker magazine, which features Eric Drucker's depiction of an empty Grand Central Station with its iconic clock in the center and a lone figure sweeping up the floors. For me, the image beautifully captures the sense of uncertainty and fear, especially in New York where I live, as we all ventured into an unknown time. Uh, time slowed or stopped for those who were asked to stay home, sped up for those caring for sick ones in the ICUs or continuing to work to maintain the city. And now, in June 2021, cities in the United States are opening and traffic is picking up and the pace of life is returning gradually to what it was. But what's different is that we have a really acute sense of the way in which our conceptions and experiences of time are anything but inevitable. And so the pandemic for me as a scholar of time um, helped to highlight um, how time matters for who we are and how we live, and that to understand a society, past or present, um, we can examine that society's conceptions and organizations of time. My book, Time and Difference in Rabbinic Judaism, examines conceptions and organizations of time in rabbinic sources, that is, in texts composed between 200 and 600 CE in Palestine and in Babylonia, but um, with lasting influences on the way in which subsequent Jewish communities also structured and organized and used their time. And in the book, I argue that the rabbis of late antiquity used timekeeping and discourses about time to construct particular social, political, and theological difference. So they, these texts, they articulate conceptions and structures of time that promoted, and I give four examples in my book, different differences, imperial difference that distinguished Roman time from rabbinic time, communal difference that distinguished Jewish time from Christian time, gender difference that divided men's time from women's time, and theological difference that con contrasted the time of humans with God's time. And what I argue is that through the process, um, that the process through which various forms of difference are constructed in rabbinic sources, be they, for example, between men and women or Jews and Christians, can't be understood unless we consider precisely those constructions and discourses and practices of time that undergird them, that allow them to, to become what they were. Um, and that's because time is this powerful mechanism uh, through which communities can forge identities and construct differences. Um, uh, the, the best example for this is, um, is the one of calendars, right? A, a community can create a calendar um, to put its members on the same time, but if that calendar um, stands in contrast to another community's calendar, it also functions as a way of separating one community from the other. And rabbinic sources recognize the distinctions in, in time reckoning and how they differentiate or are able to or have the power to differentiate between Jews and others. So here in the source that I'm showing you now, the Mechelta de Rabbi Ishmael, an early rabbinic midrash, um, we have a, a very explicit articulation of the awareness that the way in which a community uh, uses its time um, and organizes its time functions to separate them from others. So this Midrash states that a solar eclipse is a bad omen for Gentiles and a lunar eclipse is a bad omen for the people of Israel because the Gentiles reckon time by the sun and Israel reckons time by the moon. And in this Midrash in particular, there's a theological dimension. The Midrash explains that um, the Israelites lift their eyes to the heaven when they observe the new moon, and this creates this um, bond with the divine. Um, 
and, and so it shows how um, here the calendar is this mechanism for differentiation, um, the solar and, and the lunar months belonging to different communities. And so by using a lunar calendar, the rabbinic source explains that that's one of the ways that Jews become their own community in, um, in a context in which everyone around them is using the sun. Um, the Midrash notes also um, that there, there are different chronological systems, so different ways of understanding world history, and that biblical sources usually count according to their own era, that's a quote, when they date events and references to the Exodus or the temple's construction or destruction, but that they also occasionally count according to the era of others, meaning um, dating events relative to the start of foreign rulers. And the Midrash dramatically argues that relying on the times and histories of others rather than on Israel's own history and own era diverts Israel's devotion from God and eventually leads them to subjugation and oppression under the very authorities upon whose time they rely. So here the Midrash argues both for the importance of the lunar calendar in terms of constructing a, a community and also on um, a particular type of chronology where you use events in Jewish history rather than in general history in order to keep um, yourself separate um, from others. My book um, introduces, uh, begins by introducing readers to um, the complex topics of time and difference and their intersections. And then in the introduction, um, I turn to the historical and political and cultural context of rabbinic sources. Um, but rather than giving um, like a general historical overview, I tell it as a history of time, highlighting the specifically temporal aspects of Jewish, Greco-Roman, and Christian context in which the rabbis lived and thought and wrote. And I argue that um, the Jerusalem temple, on the one hand, functions um, not only as a spatial center, which is often how we think about it, as this important building in the middle of an important city, in the middle of an important land, but that the temple was also a temporal center, um, that it organized time for the people in the city, but also conceptually organized time, both on a calendrical basis, on a weekly basis, but also on a daily basis for those who lived very far from the temple. And so the, the destruction of the temple in 70 precipitated not only a spatial trauma, but also a temporal trauma that disrupted the way in which time was conceived, anticipated, experienced, and that left a practical and a philosophical void, a temporal void that the rabbis tried to fill. And so those who regarded the temple's destruction as a catastrophe um, and as this enduring loss, one of the things they had to do was to reimagine and reconfigure how time was divided and marked and used on a daily basis and to give new meaning both to the hours and days and weeks and years but also to the times in which they lived and so um, that's one of the historical contexts of uh, of the study but there are two others as well um, and the second is the roman calendar which had recently been reformed by julius caesar um, and that played an increasingly prominent role in the region, not least because after the destruction of the temple, there were many Roman legions that were um, stationed um, around Jerusalem and in the province more generally. So there was this context of Roman time, Roman calendars, and especially thinking about the importance of calendars and of time as the rabbis themselves were thinking about these topics. And then thirdly, the growing Christian communities that slowly began instituting their own times of worship in their own attempt to differentiate themselves from other Jewish communities. And so that effort at creating a community in part through time was something that the rabbis grappled with too. And we see um, in, in rabbinic sources, to which we're going to turn in a moment, um, how the rabbis really grapple with these three sort of interconnected contexts of the Jewish late antique context, the Roman imperial context, and then the emerging Christian context.
Um, the chapters of my book are divided um, along um, both according to the unit of time and to axes of difference. So the chapter about Roman and rabbinic time centers on the year and the particular way in which rabbinic texts discuss annual Roman festivals. The chapter about Jewish and Christian time focuses on the unit of the week and especially on the sacred day of the week, the Sabbath for um, on Sundays and the Lord's Day on Sunday, um, which became a contentious subject among Jews and Christians. The chapter about men and women's time centers around the unit of the day and highlights rituals attached to the official start of each day in the evening and the dawn um, of the next day each morning um, and focuses in particular on the recitation of the Shema and the observance of menstrual purity laws. And then the last chapter is about divine and human time and it explores the hour unit. Um, and how people and God are imagined to use each hour of each day. Um, so I thought um, we would spend a couple minutes looking at um, a source from each of the different chapters, and I picked my favorite sources from each of the chapters. Um, the first chapter is about Roman and rabbinic time, and specifically about how the rabbis imagined the Roman calendar and its annual festival cycle. So here what you see is an example of a Roman calendar from the first century BCE. So it's a, a Roman Republican calendar before the uh, calendrical reforms. And Mishnah Avodah Zarah, which is the rabbinic tractate that's devoted to the topic of idolatry and how to um, abstain or avoid idolatry, um, begins with a list of Roman festivals and prohibitions against participating um, not only in the festivals themselves, but in the commerce and the preparations before and after the festivals. So here is the opening passage of Mishnah Avodah Zarah, in which um, right, imagine this multi-chapter work um, tractate that has instructions about all of the things one ought to not do um, to avoid idolatry. Um, and the first thing that the tractate commands is to not participate in any form in the preparations of Roman holidays, right? So the way that the rabbis are conceiving of participating in idolatry is participating in idolatrous time. Um, and what we get in this opening passage is a list of some of those holidays that are considered idolatrous. And we won't discuss them in detail, though I do so in my book. But what's interesting is that throughout this section, the rabbis really exhibit a deep, deep knowledge of the Roman calendar and Roman festivals. And rabbinic sources are one of the sources that historians can use to learn more about Eastern Roman festivals in general. And they divide the list of festivals according to Republican festivals, so like the really ancient um, festivals, the imperial festivals that had been introduced not long before um, by the emperor and by the emperor family to commemorate um, different important moments in the emperor's life, and then personal festivals that were celebrated by individuals rather than collectively. And one of the things that I argue in, um, in my book is that while it's ironic that as the rabbis are trying so hard to separate themselves and their community from the Roman calendar, and that they try to limit interactions between Romans and Jews on certain calendar days, what they end up doing is integrating the rhythms of the Roman calendar into their own lives and embedding Roman temporal sensibilities into the Jewish calendar. Because in order to not do business, for example, um, with Gentiles before Roman holidays, you need to know exactly when those holidays are. But that's not the only way that the Roman calendar became integrated into the Jewish calendar. Um, there are also, um, in the Palestinian and in the Babylonian Talmud, extensive questions about what the meaning and the history of each of these Roman holidays it are um, and um, and what what you notice when you read them is how the rabbis tell their own version of Roman history. So let's have a look. Um, 
I, there are several Roman holidays, um, but I chose one in particular, which is the holiday of Cretaceous. It's a holiday that celebrates, according to rabbinic sources, the expansion of the Roman Empire eastward into the eastern territories. And there are a number of different explanations given um, for the, the reason why Romans celebrate this holiday. Um, in this particular version, what we learn is that there are a number of sins that Israelite kings um, did that precipitated the foundation and the expansion of the Roman Empire. And what the rabbis do is they flip the Roman narrative, a narrative that is told in um, authors such as Livy, um, and Plutarch and others about the founding of the Roman Empire, which was celebrated on a particular day um, or several days in the Roman calendar, and they tell a rabbinic version of that founding. So um, in the beginning of the story, um, the, the first part of Rome's founding, uh, the, the rabbinic text reads, um, it's the day on which Solomon married um, the daughter of Pharaoh Necho, king of Egypt. So here we have um, this explanation that um, the holiday celebrates or mourns, depending on if you're a Roman or a rabbi, um, Solomon's marriage to this foreign princess. Um, of course, th there are lots of different traditions about, um, about this person that Solomon married. Um, important for us is that she is associated with Egypt, right, this far away um, and idolatrous um, empire as, as rabbinic sources and as biblical sources present it. Um, and also in uh, biblical sources and also in rabbinic sources, she gets blamed for Solomon um, starting to practice idolatry. And so here we have this doubled warning that um, not to become too um, acquainted with um, those um, in your surroundings and also to abstain from idolatry because this marriage of Solomon caused the angel Michael to put his reed into the sea and to pull up muddy alluvium. Um, and that muddy alluvium grew and became the geological foundations of the city of Rome. Um, this image of the angel sticking his reed into the water is very reminiscent, um, and here is just one coin, but very reminiscent of um, a, a tradition in which the Tiber River um, sticks his, um, his reed into the waters. And so the rabbinic source here is playing with this um, widespread Roman imagery and saying um, it's not the greatness or the divinity um, or the chosenness of the Roman Empire that caused the geological foundations of the city of Rome to be formed, but rather it was Israelite sin that caused it. Um, also, the, the, the theme of muddy alluvium becomes very important um, also in, um, in sources about um, the founding of cities. And then we go to the next part of this um, story about the Roman holiday. And it's not only that Solomon um, married Pharaoh's daughter, but the day also commemorates um, Jeroboam and his erection of two golden calves, which was considered um, an idolatrous practice that he gets punished for in, um, in the Hebrew Bible. That sin of another Israelite king causes um, Remus and Romulus, the, the two brothers who are credited with founding the city of Rome to build two huts in the city of Rome. So here we have again this, this pairing, um, and this is a story that would have been really widespread both in the iconography of the region and also in the literature. And then finally, we have on the, on the day um, of this festival, also Elijah disappeared. And Elijah is considered the prophet who tried his best to battle against the idolatry of the Israelite kings. Um, and when he um, ascended into the heavens in a whirlwind, um, the people of Israel were left without this advocate on, um, on their behalf. Um, and that iconography of Elijah being taken up to the heavens in a whirlwind is um, 
is also found in um, in histories of Rome in which Romulus um, is taken up in a whirlwind in a way that's very reminiscent of the biblical story of Elijah. Um, and, after, and after he does, um, Numa, Rome's second king, is appointed. And so we, we could spend a whole hour on this story, but I wanted to bring this to highlight um, the way in which um, this one story um, maps on a particular version of Jewish Roman history onto the Roman calendar, such that when rabbis or people in the rabbinic community in antiquity um, looked at a Roman calendar or, or considered their time, what they ended up having was a Jewish rabbinic calendar that had days um, that they celebrated, that celebrated um, glorious times of the Jewish year um, and of Jewish history, but they also had this sort of shadow calendar, a Roman calendar that not only dictated when there were market days and when the courts were closed, but also that imprinted um, on it a sort of a shadow Roman, uh, like Israelite rabbinic Roman history of Israelite sin and um, and all sorts of other sort of moments um, that were moments of mourning or of regret um, onto the Roman year. And so here we see sort of the construction of Roman and rabbinic difference through um, the annual cycle of festivals. The second chapter turns to rabbinic discussions of the Sabbath um, in light both of Roman critiques of and also competing Christian claims to a sacred day of the week. Um, and in the first half of that chapter, I look at Tanaitic, meaning early rabbinic sources that um, extend ex exegetical discussions about the Sabbath um, that are present also in Second Temple and in, Christ, um, in, in Christian sources, early Christian sources. So here, for example, um, the Mechilta de Rabbi Shmael presents the Sabbath as a sign of the unique relationship between God and Israel, associates the Sabbath with the eschatological future, and declares that the Sabbath will never be abolished. All themes that are explored in great detail in contemporaneous Christian literature, um, and particularly in polemical literature. So in sources by Justin Martyr and the Letter of, to the Hebrews and the Epistle of Barnabas and the Didache um, and, and Ignatius. Um, and so um, what we see here is the way in which the rabbis start talking about the Sabbath is both in light of earlier intra-Jewish conversations about what the Sabbath is and why to observe the Sabbath, but also sort of in view of what other people are saying about either the Sabbath or about another day of the week um, that became important. The second half of the chapter looks at a, a series of rabbinic stories, and that's um, what I want to focus on uh, for the next couple of minutes. Um, that are found in 5th and 6th century rabbinic midrashim that um, explore the Sabbath in all sorts of interesting ways um, that promoted the day as a day with distinct qualities that were inherent to it and that I think were used to persuade Jews um, that they should be proud of the Sabbath, they should be excited to celebrate the Sabbath, um, and that they shouldn't um, be susceptible to the criticism that they were hearing from both Roman Christian and non-Christian um, interlocutors about um, Jews being lazy or the practices of the Sabbath being um, disgusting or immoral and so on. And so um, this here um, on the slide are um, two um, of many laws regarding the Sabbath that were introduced in the fourth century and that um, were reintroduced and elaborated in the later fourth century and in the fifth century onwards about Sunday. Um, and so the, these stories um, in the rabbinic sources are written in a context in which the empire that they were living in was grappling with promoting a sacred day of the week, but it wasn't the same sacred day. So this is my favorite story. Um, it's a story that some of you might have heard before. It's about delicious food on the Sabbath, and it's from Genesis Rabbah. 
And it's an interpretation of a passage that says that God blessed the Sabbath. And the question at hand is, how did God bless the Sabbath? Like, what does that mean? In what way is the Sabbath special? And in this particular answer, we hear that um, the Sabbath is special because the food is delicious. Um, it's a story about um, Rebbe, Rebbe Yehuda Hanasi, who uh, makes a meal for the emperor Antoninus on Shabbos. So um, the emperor stops by the rabbi's house. Um, and because it's the Sabbath and cooking is prohibited, um, the rabbi serves the emperor cold food and the emperor loves them. The emperor finds them delicious. And then the emperor makes the, sorry, the, the emperor returns for another meal because the first one was so good um, on a, a different day of the week. And so the rabbi is able to, to cook fresh food and is able to serve them hot. And the emperor is disappointed and says like, both of them were good, but I really far preferred the cold dishes, which is surprising um, and demands to know why the dishes on the second day weren't as tasty. Like did the rabbi, um, you know, like hold back on the spices that were used. And the rabbi explains like, no, it's just that we were missing a spice. And the, rab and the Roman emperor says, what do you mean you were missing a spice? Like I could get you anything that, that you need. And he says, no, you can't actually get me the spice. It's called Shabbat. Um, and it's a play on words because shin bet uh, taf also um, is the word for dill. So it sort of plays around with this story. Um, and it's a, it's a playful story. Um, the two images I have below are of two children's stories that were um, published, you know, in, in the last couple of years, in the last couple of decades. Um, it's a story that's still told. Um, and what I think is um, really interesting about this story is that, first of all, food and the use of food in the celebration of the Sabbath is actually not such an old idea. It's one that really develops in the first century. We see mentions of it, the earliest references in, in literature, in Jubilees and in Josephus, but it becomes a theme in rabbinic sources. Um, and, um, and the second is what um, it, it it sounds like a children's story um, when when it's told, um, but I actually think that it is in conversation with and and really an answer to very widespread polemics in the fourth and the fifth centuries that um, highlighted um, and disparaged Jews for. Um, celebrating the Sabbath in ways that didn't honor the day and that sort of displayed why Jews were carnal um, and lazy people as opposed to both um, the Christians who celebrated their sacred day in a spiritual way or Romans who were industrious and, and not idle. And so here, um, for example, in the first source, we have um, the idea of Jews celebrating um, by eating day-old foods and drinking lukewarm drinks um, and, and other other things that that Jews do, um, and that becomes a theme that um, the Sabbath is cold because you can't kindle a flame. The food is cold um, and rotten. And here you have a story in which the Roman emperor affirms that the food on the Sabbath is the most delicious food that he has ever tasted, and that can't be replicated um, even by the emperor's pantry. Um, and so, and other stories in the same sections of Genesis Rabbah and in the Babylonian Talmud describe, for example, the rewards that people receive who honor the Sabbath, um, they stress that food can be a vehicle for the sanctification of a special day rather than um, a way of, of showing disrespect for it. And it, it matches very much um, what Jews might have been grappling with um, and might have been also um, not as confident about their own Sabbath practices. So more than a feel-good story about delicious food or a humorous story, um, told for entertainment, I think it's told um, in this context of the Constantinian Sunday laws, critiques of um, Christians and pagans, and um, understood as this rabbinic attempt to make the Jewish Sabbath more attractive to other Jews, to encourage them to celebrate the Sabbath, and so on. Um, and I'll skip that. Uh, the third chapter, 
tracks the construction of gendered time by examining two um, sets of daily rituals that were mandated in rabbinic sources, some of which applied to men and others that were only required by women. And so this chapter begins with the first ritual described in rabbinic sources, um, which you can see on the right side of your screen in the Kaufman manuscript, um, and that is the recitation of the Shema prayer. So timing, um, for those who have studied the Mishnah, the Mishnah begins with a word, a question about time, from what time can one um, recite the Shema in the evening. Um, and the beginning of the Mishnah's discussion of the Shema is about the, the timing as an essential component of the Shema's recitation. Um, and, um, and one's time, the text suggests, has to be marked first and foremost by this regular declaration of devotion to God each morning and e each evening. Um, and another feature of the Shema is that only men are obligated in its recitation, right? So we have on the other, on the one hand, it's a ritual that frames the beginning and the end of each day and is very important. And on the other hand, it's only something that certain people in the community are obligated to perform. Um, and women, um, enslaved people, and children are um, exempt from this practice and also from a whole group of practices called time bound, positive time bound commandments. Um, and so women are kept apart from the central devotional prayer. But while they're excluded from it, there's this whole other set of rituals that only women or primarily women are, um, are, are asked to perform. Um, and that is this whole set of bodily purity laws that in the Bible apply to both men and women, but over the course of the rabbinic period become more and more heavily focused on women, um, much to the exclusion of men. And so the second half of the chapter looks at the constructions of women's time through um, the practices of menstrual purity laws um, and the way in which they, they parallel and mirror rabbinic discussions about the rabbinic Shema and about time-bound commandments. Um, and um, I'll, I'll mention that um, one of the interesting sort of things that I discovered in writing this chapter was how much men's time and rabbinic sources is oriented to towards the um, the heavenly bodies, the sun, the moon, um, whether it's the recitation of the Shema or um, sanctifying the new moon um, and sort of um, external markers of time and how much women's time is then predicated on sort of the internal timing of their bodies um, and, and that that itself is this, um, this component of the embodied dimension of time that really becomes embedded in, in rabbinic um, ideas about gender and time. Um, and then uh, very briefly, my last chapter explores the unit of the day um, and its hourly subdivisions, um, and specifically about God's time and the way in which rabbis imagine um, how God keeps time, whether God keeps the same time as humans, um, and how God's time is used in service of humans. Um, and so in texts from across the rabbinic corpus, but primarily from the Amoraic period, God's divinity is contingent in part on time. Um, and the unit of the hour in particular, for all sorts of um, historical reasons, including the Roman emperor's association with the unit of the hour, God is associated with the hour in particular. So God keeps an hourly schedule during the day, God has an active nightlife, um, and God um, spends the majority of time sustaining earthly life. Um, the sources that I look at wonder what God did during the hours of creation, what God has been doing with all of the hours since creation, what God does with the hours of each day and how God organizes the day into a schedule, what God does during sort of the mysterious nighttime hours, um, and then also what God does in moments of time that um, exist within the hour but are smaller units than the hour. My favorite source of all is a source from the Babylonian Talmud that asks about God's daily schedule and provides it for, um, for, for those who study this text. And it says that God spends three hours 
um, studying Torah. And then God spends three hours judging the world, three hours feeding all of the world's creatures. And then the fourth hour, um, playing, frolicking with the Leviathan. Um, this is a tradition that was actually um, a, a widespread tradition in rabbinic sources. Um, so for example, it appears also in all of the Palestinian um, Targumim, the translations of the Bible into Aramaic, in which when Moses goes up to Mount Sinai, what Moses actually learns about God is God's schedule. Like, how does God use time really well? And um, what we um, what we learn is that um, God does much of the same things that the Babylonian Talmud said God does, but instead of playing with the Leviathan, God is actually making matches between people in heaven, or be between people on earth, but God is doing it in the heavens. Um, and, um, and not only does it appear in, um, in the Targumim, but it also appears in liturgical poems and putim. in this one in particular for um, a wedding celebration. And the idea that's communicated in um, explaining what God does with each hour of each day um, is to explain that God spends a significant amount of time matching people up. Um, and so this couple that's being celebrated during this wedding celebration is a match made in heaven and has to act accordingly, right? They have to use their time in ways um, that reflect the fact that God spent so much of God's time um, helping them meet and, and creating their their union. What I, um, and then, um, well, I should say um, the tradition about God um, playing with a Leviathan is fascinating. Um, and I, um, I will only note that Leviathan, the male Leviathan, um, is partnerless at the end of the week of creation because God has killed, according to rabbinic sources, the female Leviathan for the eschatological feast at the end of days. And so at the end of the week of creation, Leviathan and God are the only two creatures left without a pair. And they're also the only two creatures that don't have anything to do because their primary work is creating the world or trying to prevent the world from being created. Um, and then also again in the eschatological battle and feast. And so God and Leviathan are really bored at the end of each day and hang out together. Um, and I think that's where the tradition comes from. And then finally, the rabbinic um, uh, discussion of God's time um, in the Babylonian Talmud wonders what God does during the day, uh, at night. And what's fascinating about this second half of the story is that as confident as it was about what God does during the day, the rabbinic sources have no idea what God does at night. And so we have this mysterious sort of, well, maybe God does the same thing at, during the day as at night. Maybe God is, you know, traversing the heavens and singing with the angels, but we actually don't know. And so it inserts this um, mystery about God's time that on the one hand, God um, God's time is accessible and God spends all time um, feeding the people, caring for them, um, except for these limited amounts of time when God does um, leisurely activities. But at night, um, we don't know. And so it adds this mystery. And what it does is really highlight sort of the um, the difference and the similarities between humans and God, that on the, on the one hand, they both exist within the same temporal system. They both have years and, and weeks and hours, um, but also that God does things at various different levels that humans can't do. Um, and also that God, and in, in other sources, God is very punctual, God doesn't waste any time, um, and so on. And um, rabbinic sources are um, not often considered the most theological of sources, and yet these are the sources about God's time that we see widespread in, um, in all genres of literature um, in Jewish antiquity. Bible translations, homilies, liturgical poems, sermons, and um, I think what we see is sort of the interface between rabbinic scholarship and popular piety um, 
comes through in sort of thinking about how does God spend time and how do people spend time, right? How, what is the perfect way to spend time and how should I spend time? Um, and what does it mean about the world and how it works to imagine how God spends time since creation? Um, by way of conclusion, I'll mention that the process of definition and differentiation didn't stop um, at the redaction of the Babylonian Talmud, um, but that, um, that they continued. And so these ideas and schedules and laws that were introduced in rabbinic sources and developed in rabbinic sources became normative in the medieval period and in the early modern and modern periods. Um, and that they dictated to various extents the way in which time was organized and enforced and practiced um, in subsequent centuries in Jewish history. Um, and medieval and modern legal literature devote a lot of energy to interpreting, um, you know, what festivals can and can't be celebrated, how to mark the Sabbath, determining the times of prayer, explicating these categories of time-bound commandments and ritual purity, and even thinking about God's time, which became um, a really popular um, subject in the disputations in the medieval period, um, for example. And so, um, in other words, these conceptions of time that um, that we start to see emerge and form in rabbinic sources end up really um, becoming a temporal map for later Jewish communities. And in my last chapter, I really trace that um, and the way in which even um, Jewish communities today are very bound to the temporal rhythms of, um, of these ancient sources. So I'll stop there and I will welcome um, questions. Thank you so much um, for sharing this research and um, and these insights. This is fascinating. There are a few questions in the chat box that came in that I'll read. In the meantime, if folks want to ask questions, you can use the raise hand function, um, or you can let me know via chat that um, you'd like to be, un be unmuted if you can't find the virtual raise hand. Uh, it's on the bottom in, re in reactions. Um, at least on some devices. So the first question that came in was, does the Babylonian, oh, sorry, no, one came in before that. Did the Romans or Greeks view time backwards? That is, did they refer to past events in the future tense? Um, so I'm not exactly sure um, uh, I'm not exactly sure about the question, but I will, I, I, I want to um, answer in, with two, with two things. The first is um, one article um, that's a really important article about Greek and Jewish time um, is by Arnaldo Momigliano. Um, and um, there's like a whole sort of generation of scholars that argued based on grammatical tenses um, in the Hebrew Bible and also in Greek that Jews and Greeks or Jews versus Greeks and Romans had completely different conceptions of time and that Greeks and Romans had really sophisticated um, ways of thinking about the past and the future um, and biblical sources didn't. And it, it was based on um, like the way that biblical grammar works with tenses. Um, and Momigliano has a great, um, a great line about this um, where he, he talks about um, like, it like that that how can you possibly have like an idea of a messiah without a future tense and that of course like the tenses of a language don't actually tell us much about conceptions of the historical past or the anticipated future um but of course um that that doesn't mean that Greeks and Romans, and here, like we're lumping all these big categories together, but um that there weren't different conceptions of time um what I think I would say is that 
um, rabbinic sources and, and ancient Jewish sources more generally have just as sophisticated notions of time, but very different ones. Um, there's a book by Sasha Stern called Time and Process in Ancient Judaism, in which he argues that um, Greek and Roman notions of time um, abstract time. So they talk about time as an abstract concept um, and that rabbinic sources and ancient Jewish sources other than the ones written in Greek um, usually think about time in terms of other human processes or natural processes. So for example, the way that the moon's phases um, change or um, saying that a certain amount of time, you know, instead of saying like an abstract hour, that they'll say it's the amount of time that it takes to get from one place to another. And so that's, he's trying to really get at the differences between Greek and Roman notions of time and, and rabbinic ones. But of course, also as we see, for example, with rabbinic discussions of hours, the rabbis are like using the notions of time in their context and really like building on those. The next question um, was from towards the beginning of your presentation, so you may have addressed it, but does the Babylonian Talmud also try to explain local holidays the way the, the Yerushalmi does? Yeah, so, so the, um, the Babylonian Talmud and the Yerushalmi both offer etiologies of each Roman festival. Um, and so I shared with you the, the Palestinian Talmud's version of Cretasis, but um, the Babylonian Talmud, for example, has a very different story, and that's about an alliance that the Jews made with the Romans during their battle with the Greeks. And um, as soon as they make that alliance with the Romans, the Romans realize that they have God on their side and they go and they write a letter to the Greeks and they say, until now we've been fighting it out and we haven't been able to declare um, a, a victor in this battle. Um, but now the Jews are in alliance with us and, um, and, um, and, and they, there's like a long story that's attached to this, but at the end of the story, the Greeks um, give up because they realize that um, that the Jewish Torah is more precious than anything that um, that a um, a military can possess, and that's how Rome defeats the Greeks and expands its empire. So that's a, a very different story about how Jews caused the expansion of the Roman Empire, but not because of Israelite sin, but rather because of is like the Jewish alliance with the Romans. Um, so so that's one example. There are also examples of um, the holiday of Calends, the Calends of January, which we now know as um, New Year's Day, uh, was a Roman holiday. Um, and in that, um, it, the Palestinian and the Babylonian Talmuds both tell a story about Adam, um, the first human, and the way in which Adam got nervous that the world was going to end as each day became shorter and shorter as, um, as the world approached the winter solstice. And then as, um, as the winter solstice passed and the days became longer, Adam realizes that it's not a day that the world isn't like reverting back to chaos. It's just like, that's the way the world works and celebrates. And that's sort of like the original calends. And the ba Babylonian and the Palestinian Talmud have very different um, versions of the story. Um, and so I, I explore all of those stories in, in the book at much greater length, of course. A couple of people have said thank you so much and that they look forward to reading the book. Um, Amanda comments um, that she's very interested in different sorts of time, particularly different sorts of Jewish time. Um, and I have bought the book, which I look forward to reading. In a few minutes, Prime Minister Boris Johnson will be saying that some restrictions will um, have to continue when it was hoped they would be lifted la last week, sorry, next week, so it works well with your initial slide. Um, are there any other comments or, or questions? Well, I, ha I had a question. <laughs> um, is there a sense that we are supposed to model the way we spend time based on how God spends time? Um, yeah, so um, the short answer is yes. Um, there is one, um, there's one Midrash, Eliyahu Rabbah, that um, details God's schedule in a way that resembles the schedule that I shared with you with one, with two important 
um, adjustments. The first is that God only spends one hour uh, in leisurely activities. It doesn't specify with a Leviathan, but we could imagine maybe with a Leviathan. Um, and that that schedule is actually used for pedagogical reasons, that it's supposed to be a model for how humans are supposed to spend time. And we know that because when every, when each person passes away at the end of their life, they meet God and God says, let me share with you my schedule. I only wasted one hour of my day in leisure. How did you spend yours? And the idea is that um, humans, and especially I think in the context of this Midrash, um, the people of Israel are supposed to sort of model the way that God spends time, their own time on the way that God spends time. So some combination of studying Torah and some combination of sustaining creatures and doing charity, as this Midrash notes, um, and working in whatever they, they, they do, um, and, and not to waste too much time in leisurely activities, however those are defined. Um, and so maybe sort of by way of conclusion, I'll say that um, I think what I love about this source in particular is that it reminds us um, that the way that we organize and use our time is a reflection of what we value and how much we value certain things and sort of the challenge that this midrash has for its listeners or its readers is that you're supposed to sort of adjust your schedule to your values um, and then and and in in that way you can be held accountable for how you spend your time and how you organize your time at the end of your life and that's sort of maybe a morbid way of ending um, but also uh, i think very much sort of at the at the heart of a lot of these sources, which is the question of how do we use our time in ways that um, convey devotion to God, in ways that fulfill God's obligations, in a way that allows prayers to be answered by God at times that God is open to prayers, um, and also not wasting times in ways that ultimately um, will be judged harshly. One more question did come in as you were speaking. Um, where did the common notion of Jewish time being um, late come from? Oh, that's a great question. So I, I don't know, I, I can't tell you like a decade or a century, though I'm sure that there is an answer, a very particular answer to that. Um, what I can do is recommend a fantastic book by On Barak called on time. Um, and it's about um, colonial Egypt and the way in which um, Egyptian notions of like time and punctuality being um, delayed um, emerged as what um, Barak calls a counter tempo. So just as sort of European notions of punctuality and schedules um, come to be associated um, with colonization and, um, and imposed um, on Egypt in certain ways that um, Egyptian time sort of pushed back and created this sort of like um, way of asserting identity through time as sort of a form of resistance. And I think um, it's one of the reasons why when I opened the talk and talked about punctuality, um, the, the, the types of times that are used or, or that emerge as being late, whether it's like 10 minutes late or an hour late or like really, really late, um, that those are often um, minority communities or um, nations that are, have like time imposed on them um, sort of geopolitically as a way of sort of um, resisting even not overtly um, all sorts of ideas that are placed on them. And so I think that that might be where Jewish time comes from. In rabbinic sources, um, the idea of not being punctual and being late is associated with women. Um, and so that is why, for example, you can't eat um, 
uh, chametz, leavened bread, so many hours before Passover because they were a little bit worried that women wouldn't be so good at telling time. So, you know, there, there are notions of like a, a community asserting its own identity through, let's say, deliberately being late or deliberately not paying attention to the clock in ways that are dominant, but also then sort of discourses of being not punctual as used to sort of um, critique certain groups. And of course, you, you see the, the interaction between like the gendered and the racial and the ethnic sort of coming together in, in all of those ways.